I'm from St. Lucia and um, uh, went to school there, high school, and then went on uh, to, to study in the United States. First degree, University of Puerto Rico, where I studied agronomy. And it, it took me about an hour or so to clean it all up. And then I went on to Cornell, where I did my master's in plant pathology, which is the diseases of plants, and then specialized in nematology, phytonematology, uh, little worms that damage plants. And um, in terms of my artistic background, um, I presume what has happened in, in, in over the last so, 20 to 30 years is what I would call the development of the right side of the brain. Mm -hmm. you, you will see that there's a lot of bark still, and there's yeah. some without the bark, because yeah. um, I used to collect driftwood in St. Lucia many, many years ago, and in fact, a lot of decorations in my home was driftwood. So it would appear that at that time, I had an appreciation of nature, an appreciation of different forms of nature. And um, since I came uh, to the United States, I decided to, to develop this further. And so I started dabbling in the arts, first of all in poetry, uh, as well as um, painting, uh, doing some sculpting from Mother Nature, etc. But, but this was just, has been a hobby over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, in more recent times, uh, people have shown some interest in my works. And so I, I kept developing um, my artistic forms in, 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 in different dimensions. So I play around with all sorts of media and all sorts of facets in art. And um, each one of these represents um, three yards of cloth. Uh, three yards? Three yards. As an agronomist or nematologist, what takes you to the world of foreign affairs? People often ask, how, how do you go from nematology to diplomacy. to diplomacy. And right. I tell them, well, um, nematology is a study of, of microscopic worms, microscopic organisms, how they interrelate with each other, how they do damage to each other, and how to control this damage. Well, diplomacy is the study of macroscopic organisms, <laughs> how they interact with each other as persons and as nations, and, and how you could um, do some damage control. And so I, I presume there is some parallelism which evolved in some way or other. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that science taught me is that there is need to define the problem before you uh -huh. start solving it. And I think this has been a, a basic problem in, in international sure. affairs. Sure. And people have different perceptions of what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And they end up not defining the problem in a rather crisp way. And this is why a lot of problems still prevail today yes. because of definition, lack of definition, definition of the problem, lack of an appreciation of other people, appreciation of people's culture and the interaction of humanity. Mm -hmm. How much opportunity did you have to use some of your artwork or to, to in some way interrelate the thinking that you bring to art and poetry to the diplomatic world, aside from the scientific world? It, it, it sort of comes out naturally. Mm. Uh, one example is, is, is the, the landmine situation in Central America. Uh, at the Permanent Council meeting, uh, um, delegates were talking about the cost of removing the landmines as a major um, event and uh, sort of trying to get funding for this. And it occurred to me that while we are removing landmines, it's quite possible that new ones would be put down. Mm -hmm. And so we would not have solved the problem. Mm -hmm. So my scientific mind told me that we haven't defined the problem. The problem Probably. will continue to exist unless we stop the, the, the planting of landmines in Central in America. Place, yeah. And I thought of the Caribbean as well. You know, one landmine costs only $3. What would you say was the highlight of your diplomatic career? Well, I would say this was one of them in terms of the hemisphere as a whole, uh, plus the fact that I was um, chairman of many committees in education, science, and, 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 and technology. And um, uh, from the St. Lucian point of view and the Caribbean point of view, I was able to, to increase the number of scholarships and training programs uh, for the Caribbean because I felt very strongly that human resource development um, was so important for the development of, of emerging countries like mm -hmm. ours. In addition to this, uh, when I joined the OES, people spoke about um, Latin America. Of course. And um, there was no mention, no of, mention the of the Caribbean. And I insisted it's Latin America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. 
and today you hear more of Latin America and the That's Caribbean. Right. Yeah. So this awareness of the Caribbean and the, 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 the particular problems related to our smallness, our vulnerability and things of this nature. Mm -hmm. Of course, you were ambassador for some 15 years, yes, and you've 13. now been out of that yes, for, yes. Uh, what, at least five years. six, five, five or six, six years. years. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So, uh, Are you pleased then with what you've seen happening in the OAS uh, and with U.S.-Caribbean relations since then? Well, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, if there's one area I was not successful in, in doing is making the U.S. Um, government at all levels recognize the importance of our banana industry. Mm -hmm. um, I left at the time where we were being challenged at the WTO, mm -hmm. um, where through pressures from um, the big companies, the United States found it necessary uh, to take us to the WTO. And um, uh, in that area, um, we are still struggling. And there again, I think it's because the lack of a proper understanding of what global humanism is all about. Mm -hmm. And this has been my more recent theme. I participated in the, uh, the philosophy department of, uh, at Howard University in, in a symposium trying to point out the importance of global humanism in international affairs. And unless big and small nations could think in terms of man, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and the betterment of man and, and people, his development, yeah. you know, then we will be looking after our own vested interests all the time. Oh, you have big nations. Uh, say, um, uh, this is in our national and interest. This is what well, is what happening, yeah, right Yes, now. what about the interests of the poor struggling people in yeah. the world? Yeah. So I think there is need for a new mindset of global humanism, and this uh, is one of my new themes. Global village more so. Uh, exactly, yeah. yes. Let's switch to art. Uh, your hobby, uh, which has now become your, uh, I suppose, your avocation uh, in, in, in retirement. Uh, did you start with oil, water? Uh, where did it all start? A apart from the, the driftwood, yes. I know you said you collected yeah. driftwood, yes. and you treated that wood as I saw yes. it. Um, yes. is, is that where you started with what you call yard art? No, the yard art concept is a concept that I developed recently. Later on. Uh, okay. Because I, 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 I felt very strongly that that art is not just for the environment of the home, but is also for the environment around the home. Mm -hmm. And as you drive around the uh, um, uh, Belle Prix Road, and in fact around the United States, you'll hardly see any art on the outside, True. except in, in, in commercial buildings, right, right. where they pay yes. vast sums of money to do that. Um, but I started as oils, mm -hmm. and um, I just couldn't manage oils, because uh, for, first of all, they took too long to, it took too long to dry, to dry you yeah. know. And then I didn't like the, 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 the fumes, mm. you know, from uh, whatever we use in oils. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went on to acrylics. Acrylics dry fast. I see. And if you don't like it, you, you could paint over it. Ah. And, um, and you could change it. Uh, you, you have less time to wait mm -hmm. to create things. I wanted my, my creativity to be swift, to be fast. And, so that as and, it happened, as you it felt happened, it, you right. could de deal with it. And as you can see, it, it, it depends on my mood. Mm -hmm. I do different things, and, and, and uh, the acrylics offered me that, that facility. I see. Yes. Uh, some of your greatest pieces, uh, I, one of the things that's starting from home, uh, everyone knows about Les Pitons, the two ah, mountains, yes, yes, the volcanic yes, mountains yes. in St. Lucia. You chose to represent these in a different fashion. Talk a little bit about how that came about. Well, there, there again, um, um, well, in, in St. Lucia, most of the artists uh, depict the Pitons as two mountains, uh, with the greenery, as mm -hmm. they are, of course, and a coconut tree and a, and, and a canoe. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I felt that, you know, well, I, deep down within, that art is, is more than uh, just a depiction of, 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 of what is, per se, almost in a photographic form, but is a conceptualization. Mm -hmm. And so I got the idea of depicting uh, the pitons and giving them their weight in gold. So you see the painting is in different um, um, hues of gold and um, uh, giving it a cubistic shape, mm -hmm. uh, which is totally different from anything that I've seen. So right. uh, there, there again, uh, there must be some creativity in art and, and there, there must be some conceptualization. So a lot of my artwork, you will see some conceptualization mm -hmm. uh, coming through. 
and, and, and this got some very good write-ups in, 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 in the Arabic, Arabic, well, Arabic press. One looks at it press. more or less as, as uh, pyramids. I, exactly, as pyramids. The guy from Egypt um, saw it at a, one of my big art shows at Rick's Bank, and mm -hmm. he was so fascinated with it. And he wrote an article on it and um, in one of the, the, the most popular, the most, uh, the most important paper in, yes. in the Arabic world, and I was very pleased. I got it translated only recently. Really? Yes. Well, that must be something to keep in frame. Oh, yes, so. indeed. Yes, <laughs> yes. You've also um, conceptualized, as you're talking about conceptualization, um, we all know Van Gogh's uh, ailment, and, and you have a masterpiece. This is a, one of your masterpieces here, yeah. how you explain this to us and tell us how you uh, were able to interpret that. Yes. Well, I'm glad you recognize it as a masterpiece. <laughs> 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 um, I had this on show as well at Riggs Bank, and it uh, fascinated quite a few people. Van Gogh, as you know, suffered from Meniere's disease. Uh, which was a disease of the inner air. Mm -hmm. and, and so he was always in a vortex. He would fall down and all the rest of it. And uh, a lot of people th uh, write about him as a madman. Mm -hmm. In fact, he ended up in a mental asylum. And um, he, has, he had epilepsy, etc. I decided to, to, to read about him. Mm -hmm. And um, I noted that they mentioned Minier's disease, which I knew nothing about. Uh, so I decided to write to the Minier's Society uh -huh. to find out a little more about the guy. And then they explained what the disease was all about. And so this painting is an encapsulation of the life and death mm -hmm. of Van Gogh. You will see it's a, almost in a vortex type painting and in the center is that light. That and one sees at the end. So, so I understand. So we say, you know, so we hear. <laughs> yes. Yes. So we hear. So that light uh, encapsulates his final moments. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the artwork is, is very much um, the life of the man and, and the vortex. Mm -hmm. In fact, one, one, one famous artist saw it one day and he told me the strokes were very much like Van Gogh. I was so elated, really. Oh, really? And, and so it, 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 it made me feel that um, the title Van Gogh's Vertigo. Perfect. Is, is, uh, my wife calls it Vertigo. ecstasy, uh, yeah. but I'll let her explain to you how she has <laughs> <laughs> arrived at that. <laughs> Looking on the other side, going from light to dark, you mm -hmm. also uh, conceptualize. Africa. You have a, a, a vision of what Africa looks like. Uh, yes. Explain that also, where we came from and, and, and yes. that yes. vision that you... Well, there again, this is an encapsulation of my scientific background in terms of evolution, evolution of man and um, the concept or reality that man evolved from Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I painted the skull of, of ancient man and um, but in his in his brain cavity, I, I have a skull of modern man. So mm -hmm. there is ancient man conceptualizing modern, modern man. man. But uh -huh. then he's looking towards Africa, and uh, you will see that within Africa uh, there is a, a painting of, of or markings of the world, the world. a world sort right. of with the longitudes and latitudes. Right. So there is a conceptualization. You know, they mm -hmm. came from Africa, so to speak. Ancient man, modern India. man, and uh, the evolution of man and the world of man coming from all Africa. All started there. All of it on a black background. Wow. That is a fascinating piece. Yes. This is one of, uh, one of the series of Afrocentric evolution mm -hmm. art, uh, you know, depicting right. uh, Afrocentric. You've also world. got one of the Madonna, mother yes. and child. Yes. This, uh, yes. That's another. Yes, there again, I, I can say that this is a tribute to, to one of our famous artists in St. Lucia called Dunstan Santoma. Mm -hmm. um, he is painted quite a bit uh, on the Madonna, the Black Madonna. Right. And right. Um, uh, so th this was my um, uh, uh, attempt to, de to depict this Black Madonna mm -hmm. in, in my own way and my own perception. You will see that, that the child is literally coming from the womb of right. the mother, the but shape, embraced by the mother, etc. Yeah. Let's move to some of the unique uh, methods that you use. You use ice fabric, uh, uh, humus. Yes, uh, yes. Tell us a little bit about how you, why in the beginning did you even think of using these? Or what, why would, how would you can decide to do something with fabric? Tell us a little bit about the fabric work. Well, the fabric work is, is, is very recent. Um, there again, as a, as a scientist, I, I, I 
I, I feel free to experiment with different things. And um, so I go to G Street Fabric and, and I buy... And scraps. Uh, well, I, I actually buy yards of cloth. Yards of cloth. Uh -huh. And each painting you'll see in there is, is three yards of cloth, mm -hmm. which I soak in water, open up the pores, and, and, and then I use that it. That helps it absorb the acrylic it, paint it, it, better? No, it, 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 it helps. I use cotton fabric. So it gives you texture yeah. then? It, it, gives, it opens up the pores uh, so that when I use my, I use a drywall mm -hmm. uh, material, ah, okay. so it seeps into it. Mm -hmm. And then I put it on hardboard and, and, and work it into different shapes and forms. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have to let it dry. And then you, 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 you spray or you paint onto it. So I have a royal blue, royal red, royal green. But then I, I could put in some calypso colors. I yeah, see so you have that bright calypso. Yes, so you have the bright yeah. colors as well. Mm -hmm. So this is what I call my new form, my, my new finding in terms of artistic expression. Mm -hmm. The other one with ice, there again, you know, uh, the, your artwork doesn't always come out. It's sometimes very frustrating mm. and uh, using a, a brush, you know, and trying to blend things. And, and since I'm self-taught, I decided, well, why don't I use ice to mm. move the paintings around? So I position the paintings in different parts of the canvas, and, and then I use the ice to move it around. As the ice melts, it, 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 it takes, it, it, it takes the, the, the paint with it. And that's using acrylic? Acrylic, well. there, mm -hmm. there again. But, you know, you have to use the ice uh, when it's really solid ice. Mm -hmm. If it melts too much, you create mud. Uh -huh. Lots of people have tried this and they've created you mud. The so, color. so you have to yeah. throw it away and then get the ice again from, from the ice tray and, and just move it around until you come up with something that's pleasant, something that's pleasing. And there are many things you could do with it. And the good thing about ice too is that uh, you could get to the original background that you had in terms of color. Mm -hmm. So you could see from some of my paintings like plumage, etc., mm -hmm. a tremendous configuration of color. Which you could, which you could not achieve using a the brush. brush. Uh -huh. You know. I see. So you, you got a. Yeah, because scope, you can maintain the base and still work over and, that. And, and, by exactly. Allowing the ice to move around. Mm -hmm. it exactly. Fascinating. You also did have something in foil. Oh yes, you aluminum foil. A, a well, this is, this is fascinating because when I, my wife and I attended various parties, I would ask them to please see, save the foil for us. You know, from around <laughs> the chicken. And, and, and the one lady was rather suspicious. She wanted to know what I was doing. <laughs> but I was recycling the stuff. I had to impress upon her that I was recycling the foil in the form of art. And she demanded a, a, a piece of works the of art. Right. She yes. needed some yes. proof. Some proof, that's right. So the Holy One was done with ice, with, 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 with aluminum foil, mm -hmm. um, the um, uh, old mech. And, and, and several others. Mm -hmm. The thing about the foil is that it, it, it gives the, the type of background which you can't normally get just painting on. It, it gives a, a certain texture. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, with the Holy One, you'll notice uh, the glow around uh, the Holy One. Yes, yes. And uh, the texture is distinct. That texture is, yes, yes. yes really so the, this is, was fascinating. It's, it's a bit tedious because you have to tear up the bits and pieces, put them together, stick them onto board or or canvas, and, and then start working. Mm -hmm. And since I do everything myself, uh, rather tedious, so I've stopped doing it for the time being until I get into a new mood, you know? I see. You also obviously have been doing this for so, some time. You have such a vast collection of so many different types of work. You've got from the very small pieces to the very large pieces. Um, is this something that you decide to do every day or do you just wait until you have the mood or how does how have you been able to do this over the years well it, it depends on, on on my mood you know um, you're correct I have so many different types and forms and shapes you know from floral to abstract to scenery and all the rest mm -hmm. of it also a depiction of of, of history you, you will see some of those um, uh, some pre-Columbian forms, etc. It depends on my mood, uh, whether I paint or I write poetry, and what type of poetry I write, what type of painting I, I end up with. I don't do it every day. Mm -hmm. And I found that um, uh, lots of people buy the small pieces because uh, they're not very costly, 
and uh, they buy them as gifts mm -hmm. and have lots of originals in, in this. And the house has gotten so overloaded with works of art uh, that I had to find an outlet. So mm -hmm. various galleries have asked me to, 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 to hang some of my stuff with them. Mm -hmm. And I also do benefits um, mm -hmm. uh, for the Multiple Sclerosis um, Society, uh, the Caribbean organizations, uh, the Kiwanis wives, mm -hmm. and so I, I hang some stuff for them and, and they get the X percentage of the proceeds. So the, 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 there's, an, there's a fulfillment and enjoyment in what you do, and at the same time you're making a contribution. Right. Let's talk a little bit about your poetry. Uh, you've written two books of poetry, but, one, real, one yeah. big book of poetry, yeah. uh, and you have some other thoughts that you've also put down in a, a smaller book. Would you read for us one of your favorite pieces from uh, the poetry book, uh, Many Horizons. Mm -hmm. What has inspired you while you're choosing that? What, what inspired you to move to poetry? As, is this something that you developed simultaneously with art, or is this something that you've done just recently? Well, I've, I've been writing poetry for many years now, and um, when I look at the dates of my early ones, uh, it's uh, about uh, three decades or more, you mm -hmm. know. But I've been just, uh, it, it's the expression of, of one's inner self. I put, I put them in a drawer, and, and one day I, I, I saw I had quite a compilation of stuff there. So I sent it to, to Medgar Evers, New York University, mm -hmm. and asked whether they're worth anything, whether they're publishable. And I was told that they were gems and that they would publish them and all the rest of it. Ah. And um, so I proceeded to, to go over them and, and shape them appropriately. Mm -hmm. And, and um, this led to, to, to this publication, Many Horizons. Many Horizons. And this is just a small selection of, of what I have there. There are only 99 poems in there. I'm preparing for my second publication, Many Voices Calling, and um, uh, probably another 100 or so. And I still have many more. Wow. It's, it's, it depends there again on my, on my mood. And, and experiences, I suppose. Experiences as well. Because a lot of these poems, um, they don't rhyme. It's, it's about humanism. It's about preoccupation, uh, and nature. And thoughts cross and, your mind yes, as you yes, experience yes. certain things. Uh, Let's hear some of it. Uh, them and I. Uh, Th th this one was very much inspired by the Rastafarians of, of, of Jamaica, mm -hmm. you know, I and I sort of thing, you know. That's right, yeah. And it's a very popular one. Everybody asked me to read this one. <clears throat> it's them and I. I live with them all. I live with all of them. Them and I represent the race, the human race in them all and I. I, as part of them, the race, together live on in time and space, manifesting the norm of the race. But I am I in spite of them. The them influence the I. But the them is not the I that I am. Though the them is the I in part. For I am part of them. I must not be totally absorbed by them. Nor must I be them devoid of the I as I. For the absorption of them would remove the I from I. I am the expression of I. Not the dilution of them. I must, I am the exaltation of I, in spite of the dilution of them. I must continue to preserve the I, in spite of the influences of them. I must, like them, exert the I as I in I, not the mirror of them, but the I, in spite of them. them. So it shows you the conundrum in which we are faced in That's this world right. today. People are trying to tell us who we ought to be and how we ought to act. And this has its dimension both in terms of human relations, also mm -hmm. in terms of international Internet. relations. People telling you what you should what do, you should what be you should doing. Doing. That's right. and removing the eye from eye. Then so you you yes. Very poignant for the Caribbean right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Is there another small one you would like to share with us? Oh. Well, it's, it's, it's another one which, oh. which is a, a reflection of probably uh, myself as a, as, a, as a kid growing up and what I am today. And I presume also um, 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 uh, something I, I wish to say to, to the youth, you know, mm -hmm. who'd always like to be um, somebody else or something else. Yes. And it's thank God for me. I thought it would be great to be as free as a bird, 
to glide on high in the sky with grace and ease so beautiful until I recalled my moving target, a sport I enjoyed in my youth, killing birds. I thought it would be great to be as huge as an elephant, to thump the ground with mighty weight until I remembered the hunt. I thought it would be great to be as free as a fish, to explore the wide oceans, to live in perpetual schools until I remembered last night's dinner. Then I thought of the many other things I would like to be and concluded, thank God I am me, thank God for me. Reminds us that we have to be thankful for God exactly. at all times. Exactly. A very fitting end. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And again, thank you for letting us in to view this wonderful art.